fiction, science fiction, horror, fantasy, crime, LGBT, thriller. You have now entered the house of mystery with your hosts, Eric Shapiro, David North Martino. John Copenhaver and Al Warren. Heard on KCP 106.5 FM Los Angeles. 102.3 FM Riverside. And 105.0 AM Palm Springs. Okay, and we're back. And joining us is Ken Summers. Now, he's the author of Queer Hauntings. And also, you have a website now, don't you? It's The Moon Spenders? Moonspenders.com, yes. Right. So, uh, thank you for joining us and the show. Yeah, thank you for having me. Uh, it's my pleasure. Now, I um, want to uh, start out, let's, let's start out with um, who you, telling the audience kind of who you are and, and where you come from and what, what's sort of your background. I'm from northeastern Ohio. I've been investigating, researching uh, ghosts and history behind ghost stories for approximately 20 years now. It's been a bit of a while. I started out a bit young. Um, I do a lot of writing about different paranormal uh, related topics. I, I mostly stick with ghosts, but uh, my interests are pretty broad. I'm interested in anything from cryptozoology to um, uh, lost and abandoned, um, missing artifacts type of things to UFOs, pretty much you name it. Have you had any personal experiences with ghosts? Let's start with that. I have, but I... I I think the best way to sum myself up is I consider myself a fence sitter. I, I've since the beginning I've noticed this constant war between skeptics and believers, and people set, tend to put themselves into those two camps and fight amongst each other uh, over the topics. And I feel like I'm just standing on the sidelines, watching them argue and trying to make my way without getting involved. Um, I, I, I'm sort of a, a mixed, uh, eclectic type of person. Um, as far as my own beliefs, I'm, I've never been a religious person. I don't really want to call myself an atheist because I think a lot of those people are complete jerks. Hmm. Uh, so I don't fit into that category. I've grown up with a lot of friends who are Wiccan and Pagan. Um, I've known people who were Christian, Jewish, Muslim, everything out there. So I try to keep a neutral stance. I think that's what, to me, puts myself apart from the standard ghost hunting pack, is I try and separate religion from all of the stuff. And it's not that I'm trying to walk on someone's beliefs, but I'm trying to look at phenomena from a non-religious standpoint to figure out exactly what's going on. Uh, past lives, I used to be a bit of a believer in that. Right now, I don't know what to think about it. Uh, but I'm, I'm openly optimistic about things, but at the same time, I try and be logical and rational about as much as I can. Uh, that makes me sound like a major skeptic, but at the same time, I have had experiences like... Uh, probably the, the one that sticks out most in my head is there's a place near where I live in Ohio called Lonesome Lock. It's an abandoned canal lock on the Ohio and Erie Canal uh, built around 1830. And there's been a ghost story attached to it for at least 150 years now of a woman who was murdered and her body thrown into the canal lock. Um, and supposedly her ghost haunts that lock. And back when the canal was in operation, people would be terrified of staying the night there because the headless woman in white was supposed to wander the lock. Um, I have 
I personally caught her voice on tape uh, in an EVP. I know several other people have recorded the same voice at other times. Uh, and on one particular occasion, I saw... Uh, the only way to describe it is a perfect movie version of a ghost. It was a glowing shape. It was like a glowing fog shaped perfectly like a human being. And it walked down off of some railroad tracks and started crossing the path. And before it hit the other side, it just vanished into thin air, sort of went out like a light. So um, I've definitely experienced things that I can't explain, um, which gives me the non-skeptical side where I think there's something to this, but I don't want to say it's the dead come back to life. Or in, in one way or another, or I, I just, I like to say I don't know what it was. To me, it's unexplained, but I'd love to find out what it is. Right. And so now, when you, do you actually do ghost uh, hunts, as they call it, or kind of research like that? Um, I, lately, I really haven't been doing too much actual ghost hunting. I've been doing a lot more historical research. Uh, what I what I like to do and what I tend to do is when I find out about a haunting or have an experience or know of someone who had an experience at a place, I like to look into the past history of that particular location and dig through tons of old archives and see if there's any possible explanation historically for what people have actually witnessed. Um, uh, that To me, that's the most fun part is actually trying to find concrete documented evidence supporting something that people are saying. Like even my personal experience seeing that glowing figure, it turns out that in the 1890s at that exact location, um, a delegate uh, from Cleveland uh, was on the train that was traveling through there and he was jolted to one side when he was moving between cars, and his head struck the bridge, and he was killed instantly right at that location. Have you been back and tried to research it more or see if you found anything out since then? I've, it's, it's been a few years now since I've been there, but I've probably been there on investigations at least 40 or 50 times over the years, over the past 10 years. Um, I, it's... I guess you could call it a crapshoot. It's one of those places where there'll be nights where you go and absolutely nothing happens, everything feels perfectly normal, and it's just a nice peaceful night of sitting in the dark for several hours, and you get absolutely nothing. And then you get other nights where it seems like it's the most terrifying place on Earth, and I even somewhere, the problem is it's on high eight, uh, tape, so I haven't been able to digitally download it. Um, but I did record a a video of a light at that location. It looked like the light was coming down um, the canal, even though there's absolutely no water in the canal. And on the tape, the light is extremely bright. When I saw it with my own eyes, it looked like it was about candle strength. Hmm. So when you go uh, to this place or any other place, have you ever taken a medium there or anywhere else? Or I, I have. I've, I've, I've known a lot of mediums over my years. A lot of people who uh, either call themselves sensitive, or psychic, or anything like that. Um, <clears throat> and that's where I, it's another gray area for me because I've known a lot of people who use those terms to describe themselves and they are obviously not on with anything. They completely miss the target with every single thing about it. Uh, but then I've known other people who've said things that they would not have any knowledge of. Um, so uh, I, I walk a fine line with uh, psychics, mediums, and all of that. Uh, I, I, some of them have provided interesting things, but I, I don't like to rely on them too much. I'm, I'm, I'm one of those just the facts, ma'am, type of people. Yeah. Well, you know, and and until you find someone, if you 
find them reliable for a period mm-hmm. of time, it's tough, right? So yeah. yeah. Is is there any anything that influences you? So like like on TV, there's tons of shows out there, and uh, there's tons of books now, and uh, it's kind of like uh, yeah. in fashion. Is there any that you find that you enjoy watching or reading or you find inspiration in? Oh, I I've watched pretty much all of the shows, at least a few episodes. Most of them, I either sit back and chuckle to myself or want to punch the television. Uh, <laughs> because most of the time, it's people who have no clue what they're doing, talking about things that are not even remotely close to true, uh, f- histories that they've gotten completely screwed up and have gotten all wrong. Uh, so a lot of it is teeth gritting annoyance uh, but I look at it as it's entertainment and when you get involved in the television world behind the things that happen behind the scenes um, they change reality in a lot of ways so what you see as reality television is not in any way shape or form necessarily what that person thinks or what is actually happening in a paranormal sense um, but I, I do like some of the shows. Um, I was a, I grew up on In Search of, so I've always liked the old classic shows a lot better than the newer ones. Right. Uh, I'm also a big X Files person, so uh, the fictional aspect of it is always a lot better than the reality of it. Um, but uh, I read a lot of books. I have a relatively extensive library. Mostly um, research materials. I have a lot of um, books on various occult and supernatural and cryptozoological things uh, that I use as a reference for a lot of things. But I have a lot of paranormal books, um, stuff like that. I I read a lot. I, I grew up reading... Uh, somewhere I still have my old copy of uh, Lloyd Arbach's uh, ESP Hauntings of Poltergeists, mm-hmm. which is one book that I recommend for anyone who's ever getting to this field. It was I think it was published in '84, uh, but it's still much better than anything written by anyone who's been on television. Um, Lloyd Arbach is sort of one of those people I idolize because he was out there before all of this stuff was popular, him and Hans Holzer were in a different class than the modern uh, paranormal celebrity, in my opinion. Yeah, it's, it's much tougher, I think, to um, really pick out um, who's real and who's not. You know, yeah. it is entertainment, and, and you know, it's, it's, I think it's really tough to, to decide. I, I've interviewed quite a few and um, been very disappointed in people I've liked. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, this, the, the problem is they can be likable. They can be really good people. But when you get a production company behind it and producers uh, who are directing them in different directions and you have contracts involved where you have to do what they say you have to do, it really gets convoluted and it it ruins it I've known people who have had their careers ruined by paranormal television and the the effects of producers telling them you're gonna do this and I don't care what you think and if you don't I'm gonna sue you. Yeah. Yeah. Well I mean in your it's a tough situation, right? It, yeah. You know. And and plus you, you know, it's in their hands. Uh, yeah. When you go doing an investigation or something, and they're filming you, they you're there for a week or ten days with 120 film crew. Yeah, it's going to be different than if you just really went with a couple of people. Yeah, yeah. and and some of these people have they have good ideas, and some of their ideas are good, and some of their ideas are really bad. Uh, and, you know, I I don't hate on anyone who's in front of a camera because I've been in front of a camera before i've been completely misquoted by the press on several occasions uh as so i know what can happen and you know just because i disagree with someone doesn't mean that i automatically don't like them 
And I, there are a lot of people out there with, out there in the paranormal world that I, I don't agree with everything they say. I don't necessarily believe the same things that they do. But at, on a personal level, I think they're really great people, and I would enjoy working with them. Uh, but it's, it gets hard when you have differing opinions. People get really heated about that. Yeah, they get real emotional about it. Take it personal, you know. Yeah. Yeah, especially, uh, I guess, with the religion and that area, too, right? Some people oh. are pretty strong into their... Extremely, yes. Um, I... I and I, I don't, I don't have a problem with anyone having any religion at all. But when you try and turn paranormal investigation into spiritualism, I, that's where I get a little bit uncomfortable because there's such a danger of taking paranormal investigation and ghost hunting and turning it into a religion. And I think the danger with that is if you if you equate it with a religion, you're treating it based on pure belief and not uh, what you can actually derive from something. And to me, it's the, the problem with a lot of investigation is you're passing over the the scientific aspect while still saying it's being scientific. The, the whole question of what a ghost is has been s sort of tentatively answered and skipped and moved on to the point where people are theorizing about, well, ghosts are made up of electromagnetic energy and this and that. When you're talking about theories that haven't, you, you haven't answered the what is a ghost question first. You have to answer that first before you can move on to what they're composed of and all of this other stuff like that. It's 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 a lot of leaps forward that are too far of leaps and especially when you get involved in the whole demons and angels thing, I I get really uncomfortable with that because I think it's I think it's a disservice to say, well, there, there's some black malevolent force over here and that's definitely demonic when you know people can be good and bad it doesn't matter it that just because someone is bad if someone is a serial killer like H.H. H. Holmes it doesn't mean that they're a demon it just means that they're a really bad person who is really messed up in the head it doesn't mean that they are demons so why do we have to do the same thing with the paranormal world and say just because something is not pleasant it's automatically a demon, or if it's good, it must be a guardian angel. And all these leaps uh, have always really troubled me. Yeah. Well, I think it's, a, you know, if someone's using a religion to get themselves through life, Yeah. I guess it's it's kind of uh, the brain's way of just making something logical. Like, it has to be a demon, then, if, if, if you believe... Yeah. In Christ, or near a Christian, and then that's that's going to be your the natural assumption, right? Yeah, well, it's religion does have a good uh, it has its benefits in society. I mean, uh, it it can help you get through really horrible times, and it can give you a sense of purpose. It can give you a sense of meaning in your life. It can do a lot of things, uh, but to to have a religious connotation to things and in the same breath or in the same paragraph on your paranormal group's website say that you're approaching things from a scientific perspective, it's not the same. It, you're, you're not approaching things from a scientific perspective if you're calling things demons and you're making all these assumptions and leaping uh, forward when you're not looking at things in a scientific way. Right. Yeah, I agree totally. Okay, well, we're going to take a break and come back and talk about your book. Okay, and we're back. And um, now I wanted to uh, touch off a little bit about the uh, book. Now, I went through it, The Queer Hauntings, and uh, um, I did notice, uh, the, you know, the first story being about Lizzie Borden. Yes. Now, you know, I had no idea. Now, so she had a lesbian affair? Well, like a lot of the stories of my book, they're on the contro some of them are on the controversial side. Uh, it's never been proven with concrete fact that she was a lesbian. 
uh, it's been questioned by enough people that I figured it was worth including. Uh, there are a lot of people that believe she did have... Um, she had a friendship with an actress, um, and some people think it was more than a friendship, and that they were actually lovers, and that's what led to the split between her and her sister, and the reason why they didn't speak for about 30 years after that. Um, but it's... It's one of those things where there's there's never any proof of someone's sexuality. Uh, a lot of times, these things were covered up. So it's it's one of those things you can't prove or disprove. It's just it's a gray area. It really surprised me. I didn't I didn't know. Uh, did you watch the Lifetime movie that was just out a while ago with Christina Ricci? Uh, was it about Lizzie Borden? Yeah, the Lizzie Borden. Because uh, they, they sort of said that, um, well, they went through the whole trial and the whole thing and mm. and the actress and all that, but um, they made it sound like um, the sisters stopped talking because Lizzie confessed to her sister that she had done it. Well, Lizzie was never proven to have done it. Um uh, and that's where you get into more gray areas where people today are still trying to solve the, the murder. But it's still one of those things where it's the evidence isn't blatantly obvious that she absolutely 100% did it or not. Um, and you have to think whenever you're talking about a script, you're taking something in one direction or another. So it, uh, nobody knows what that conversation that they had was. Uh, so people are still guessing. Some people guess that it possibly could have been that she had somehow confessed to her sister. It could have been that her sister found out that her and her friends had an affair. Um, I just went with one line of thought from the research that I pursued that her sister did not like this actress at all, and she didn't like the parties that they were having, and it did create friction between the two. Uh, I don't know if... The, I, I'll have to watch that to see if they include uh, the actress at all in in any aspect at all. But, yeah, I, I've not seen that one. Yeah. I, I mean, it's okay, but they sort of really... They're suggesting is that she she did do it, of course, and and that, yeah. uh, the split up was the confession. So, yeah. you know, it's something, uh, again, yeah, you, there's nothing that's really tangible mm -hmm. there. It's just sort of a theory. Yeah. Uh, well, I, when I wrote the book, I everyone is always focusing on the murder. And that's what everyone focuses on. Whenever they think of Liz Lizzie Borden, they think the 40 Wax, uh, the trial, and her being essentially acquitted of murder and getting off scot-free whether she did it or not is another big controversy but that's what everyone focuses on and so I kind of summarized all of that in a very short span because I didn't want to focus on that because what I think is more interesting is uh, what happened after the murder because nobody ever talks about that people don't know people assume Lizzie Borden haunts the bed and breakfast where the murders happen, and that's not actually where her ghost has been seen by people. And it's her; she's really a tragic person. It's really a sad story about her. Uh, and she was completely ostracized by everyone because of the murder trial and everything. Uh, and she's... I try and be a little bit more sympathetic toward her because she was basically a lonely woman who died by herself and with her animals. Uh, she was a, she was an animal lover. She, I think it was $30,000 in her will that was donated to the local animal shelter when she died. But it's, it's a really interesting story. Hmm. Yeah, I was really surprised by the book and the fact that I, when I first got the title and, and, and the book, I was thinking it was going to be different than what it was. Um, okay. Uh, which is no, it's a good thing. It's not a bad okay, thing. I was, good. I was like, I was pleasantly surprised. How's that? Not, That's better. Yeah. Not, not like, oh my god. It was no. <laughs> it was, it was much. It was a much better read and a much better book than I was expecting. Because quite often, 
when you get into the when when you get into a subject like let's say queer hauntings or the yeah. of, of the gay manner or of any of any subject matter sometimes it's well you know because then it just becomes about the sexuality yeah. sometimes and 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 this totally was a lot more to it and well, I am essentially, uh, even though I don't have a degree in history, I consider myself a historian. Uh, you could call me an amateur historian, um, even though I do extensive research. Uh, but um, for me, I always like focusing on the history. So uh, that's actually one thing that people tend to expect when they see the book on the shelves and they buy it is they expect it's going to be a spooky book about all these creepy ghosts and things like that. And I lean a lot more toward the history, so it's more of uh, a bit of a history lesson with a ghost thrown in at the end. Um, I also I try not to take myself or anything else too seriously, so I do have a little bit of fun with some things whenever I can without getting in too deep with that. Right, and so what was the uh, the the reasoning behind the queer hauntings itself? Like, was there a thought behind that? Well, it started out. I I used to be a pretty regular blogger, and I would write. I I tried to make it a bit on the humorous side, talking about um, strange news stories, amusing news stories related to the paranormal, uh, amusing ghost stories and things like that. I uh, tried to keep it light and funny and interesting. And I'm, I've always been on the search for lesser-known ghost stories. I don't like doing what's popular. I like doing something as unique as possible. And I've always thrown out these strange ideas. I remember there was one blog, uh, one actually an article that I wrote for an uh, um, online website called Who Forded, which is soon going to be called Weak and Weird. Um, but it was about naked ghosts, because there's always been this joke around about how ghosts are always seen with their clothing, so doesn't that seem strange that clothing can come back as a ghost? So I decided, well, are there naked ghosts out there? So I started digging into that, and I found stories like uh, a naked Roman soldier seen in Bath, England, uh, around what used to be a bathhouse uh, in Roman times. Um, he's been seen naked. How they know he's a soldier is another story altogether. <laughs> uh, if he's completely naked, maybe he's still wearing his helmet. Yeah. Uh, but, <laughs> But uh, so I always like trying to find strange stories like that and ask myself, well, what kind of ghosts don't you ever hear about? And that's where this came in, where it was sort of this running thought in the back of my head for the longest time. You you always hear of like a woman whose uh, fiance goes off to the Civil War and is killed in battle, and she's seen haunting this mansion, waiting for him to come home eternally. But you don't hear about a man waiting for his boyfriend to come home or a, a woman waiting for her female lover to come home or anything like that. So it got me wondering, are there such things as gay ghosts? And it started off with what became one of the chapters in the book called Corpsewood Manor. Um, I stumbled across that story and it was so interesting uh, and it's been one of the most controversial things that I've ever written because so many people have an opinion about the murders and who's bad and who's good in the whole storyline. But after writing a blog post about that, I started digging in and just searching everywhere I could to try and find stories with some kind of gay connotation, uh, finding uh, well-known gay personalities, gay and lesbian personalities, who haunt certain places and it was just this constant piling of research uh, and once I had what I considered to be sufficient enough stuff I started working on a few sample chapters and sending them out to publishers and seeing what happened and someone luckily actually took the risk on it and decided that it was worth a shot hmm. and so did you find any? No. <laughs> well, you know, it's it is kind of silly, uh, yeah. you know, and I never thought about it before because 
I just went with the flow, right? And it never came yeah. to my mind, like, why, now that you say it, um, why wouldn't there be ghosts from gays as well as straights? And yeah. it just, like Rock Hudson, for instance, is, yeah. is he, maybe you're not allowed to be a ghost if you're gay. Yeah, well, it, it, that's where a lot of people wonder if, if sexuality has anything to do with spirituality. And it's always been sort of this thing, I guess, uh, again, going back to the religion thing, uh, people who think that it's immoral or against God or anything like this. So does that mean that because uh, certain people with certain religious beliefs think that it's a sin or that it's an abomination or that it's a terrible thing, does that mean that those types of people do not produce ghosts? or um, ghostly phenomena. Um, so it, it was actually, I found more stories than are actually in the book, but I haven't extensively researched all of them. Um, I'm still contemplating doing a sequel or uh, an updated, revised, expanded type of edition, um, but um, I've come up with more than I expected to find. Well, I would think there'd be an endless amount. It's just... I would imagine, for the most part, it's just not uh, public because of so many years yeah. in our history where we wouldn't talk about it. Exactly, and but there are occasional stories you run across. I think there's one story, I believe it takes place in Tennessee or somewhere in that rough region, that I read about somewhere online in passing of supposedly a bridge haunted by a man who was murdered for being gay, but I've never found anything else about what that place is or what the story is behind it. And without a location, I can't do research. So just these random internet stories that don't have any specifics with them have left me sort of high and dry with a lot of things. But there are a lot of people who... Uh, there are some famous people in it, but there are a lot of lesser known people in it and I think um, in a lot of respects it's it's interesting the the journey of going through because I, I spoke with a lot of people about it uh, and a lot of these things I, I spoke with Ben breakfast owners who are total skeptics who even though they were total skeptics they would say when I asked them more about have you had anything strange happen? They would say things like, well, the dog really doesn't like going in this one room and does growl a lot, but I don't know what it is. I think that, um, how do people react to that? Like when, when the book came out and when, when things were, were, were going along, did you get a lot of negative reactions? Um, I got a lot of curiosity with it. Uh, I, I didn't really know if there were any negative aspects of it. Nobody was forward about it, and nobody said it, at least to me. Um, I did have um, Jimmy Fallon, uh, Late Night with Jimmy Fallon. Um, he was doing this series called The Do Not Read List, and where he was taking suggestions from people about book ideas and all that. And he, I found out after the fact, because I generally don't watch a show, yeah. uh, but I found out that he had chosen my book um, in one of his episodes, and he was talking about it. And I had a lot of people come up to me and say, well, that was just rude of him, that was terrible of him. And they weren't really paying attention to what he was doing. He showed the book, he talked about it, and he was cracking jokes about gay ghosts, not about the content, not making fun of the book itself, but making fun of the idea of the book. Because, honestly, it's an absurd idea. It's, it's a silly idea that, are there gay ghosts? And uh, you give something like that to a comedian, and he's going to do something with it. Uh, and I, I find it, I, I don't take myself too seriously, so even I thought it was a silly idea for a book in the first place. Uh, but that's part of the reason why I did it, because it's silly yet intriguing at the same time. Yeah, well, that's what I mean. I was, uh, as in, I was saying I was surprised. I mean, 
pleasantly yeah. uh, because I wasn't sure how it would read. You know, I wasn't, yeah. you know what I mean? It, it's kind of, mm-hmm. um, yeah. uh, that was just questionable that way. So, yeah. Well, I, I, I'm a firm believer of quant- quality, not quantity. So some of the stories are extremely short, and I've had more than one person tell me it's a quick read. And I say that's because that's all there was to it. I wasn't going to try and stretch out a one-page story into a 20-page story. I tell you what information there is, and I leave it at that. Uh, but I try, I try and be respectful to the people who were involved and have a little bit of fun with it. Um, I'm always creative with my titles for chapters and things like that. Uh, but I, I try and take it as lighthearted as possible. Did you hear back from any of the people that were involved with any of the ghost stories? I have not. Um, I have. I. I did contemplate going to some of these places and doing something uh, publicity-wise. Um, when I when some of these stories were blog posts, I did hear back from some people uh, involved with them. The, the corpse wood I have had. I've been inundated with uh, comments and emails about how this is wrong and how these people were really evil and how they poisoned these people. They they, they drugged them with LSD and. I've heard back from even people related to the people who were charged with the murders. Uh, So (laughs) that's been a wild case. But there's a bar in San Francisco called Trax that saw my blog post, and they were were having an anniversary. And one of the publicists in charge of that actually took my blog post and turned it into flyers to pass around to people so that they could hear about the ghost story involved with that bar. Is there a story or uh, one of the ones that you researched and you found out about that really kind of, I guess, what, freaked you out or scared you or kind of... Yes. Uh, Corpsewood. The first story, the first chapter that I wrote was Corpsewood, even though it's several chapters into the book. Um, the, the murders themselves were quite horrific. Uh, it was, it was a basically, essentially, it was a botched robbery. Uh, there was this couple, uh, these two men, uh, Charles Scudder and um, Joseph Odom, who moved from Chicago to middle of nowhere Georgia and built this mansion by hand, brick by brick. And they just wanted to live off in their own little place and live a nice quiet life Uh, people thought that they were rich because one was a retired professor and uh, these two guys decided to rob them and it turned into a murder and they had no money so I think they got away with maybe sixty dollars this happened early 80s Uh, but it was a horrific place I know people who've actually been on investigations there and said it's it's quite a creepy place to go to. Uh, but when I was in the process of writing it, I don't know if I was freaking myself out or not, but uh, while writing the chapter itself, I did have a few nights where I felt like I was not alone in the room and something was not happy with me having written this story. <laughs> Makes you want to believe in ghosts. <laughs> Absolutely, yes. <laughs> So now, and now, tell us about um, getting into your 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 blog and stuff, and your website. So, what's that all about? Well, I haven't actually touched the blog in quite a few years. Um, there's a link on my website, moonspenders.com. Um, toward the bottom, there's a link for the blog itself. It's called Spooked. Um, I started it back in. I think around 2000 or so. Don't quote me on that because I'm terrible with dates. Um, There's also a link to Who Forded, where a lot of my articles are uh, about ghosts and other various topics. Um, And there's a section in there, too, called Queer Hauntings, where you can actually go in and you can look up different stories. Um, There's just real quick little couple of sentence summaries of um, each place, but I have 
in the book and on the website. I have addresses for any places that are public. Uh, I try to focus on public places because my idea is if, if, whether you're a believer or a skeptic, if you know where something is, you can go check it out for yourself and see uh, see what you experience, see what you find out, and see if you have anything happen to you that's unexplained. Uh, so I, I'd rather have it be more of a hands-on type of thing. So if you don't necessarily believe me, or if you hear the stories and think, well, that sounds interesting, you can actually go to these places yourself and whether it's a bed and breakfast or a bar or a museum or anything like that, you can go there for yourself and see if anything happens to you. Okay. And so now you were talking about um, other paranormal things. So like you have an interest in UFOs? Yes, I, I, I try and consider myself neutral with a lot of things, but I'm not... You won't see me wearing an aluminum foil hat or anything like that. I'm not a paranoid conspiracy theorist or anything like that. Uh, but it's something that interests me because I read um, I, I read files from Project Blue Book. I read oh, I have a, a few books on the subject, um, but I I don't know whether aliens exist or not, obviously the likelihood of there being some life form on another planet, I consider it to be pretty high. Uh, but people have witnessed things in the sky for hundreds of years that are obviously not stars, and they're not all meteorites, and they're not all Venus. Uh, so I, I wonder, and I've always had this strange theory uh, both it connects with ghosts and UFOs all in one. Um, a lot of people have this idea that ghosts are UFO ghosts are the dead coming back to life. UFOs are uh, aliens from another planet. And I've always wondered what if people are completely wrong about that and it has everything to do with time. And even though they say time travel is next to impossible, if not impossible to do. What if there is a way to do it, and what people see as these strange crafts in the sky are actually a future version of ourselves coming back to look at specific events and specific moments in the past that could be <sighs> the cause of the, the UFO phenomenon in the first place is just... Yeah, the future of us yeah. coming here. And with ghosts, I've wondered if, um, instead of how we always think of time as a linear thing, time is, in some theories, time is all happening at the same time, and it's all layered upon itself. And what if there's a way for certain circumstances to happen where uh, the layers of time get distorted slightly, and what we see as a ghost is actually a glimpse into the past, and we're actually seeing someone who's actually in the past, or they're seeing us, um, and it's random theories, but I like to try and think about these things. Yeah, no, I think that's an interesting one, too. I like that. What about, but then what about people that are being probed, <laughs> you know, being uh, taken and well, abducted? That's a good question. Uh, could it be that, if it is a future scenario, could it be something to do with DNA and something have, having gone wrong and them trying to figure out what went wrong or figure out how to alter their own DNA and fix what is going wrong in the future? Um, but a lot of these stories are a little bit out there. But then you look at, like, Benny and Bonnie Hill, the really famous incident where there is physical evidence left behind. There's a dress with stains on it and strange things that still can't quite be explained. So, you know, I my attitude with a lot of this stuff, especially this, is I don't know the answer. I just come up with ideas and say, well, maybe it's this, maybe it's that. I don't know for sure, but 
hopefully at some point someone will figure out something that can say whether or not this is a possibility. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I'm kind of hoping there's being probed on certain <laughs> 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 But, you know, I was kind of... Uh, uh, Getting getting into that, but you know. yeah. <laughs> well, you know, we can't, and we don't even know. I mean, I I would think that if it was our people in the future coming back and and maybe trying to change things and doing DNA, man, mm-hmm. they got to do a lot of fixing of what's going on now. Yeah, I mean, it seems like there's a lot of stuff. I mean, you look yeah. at what's going on with the beheadings and all the the, yeah. the different stuff, right? So I would I would hope they'd fix it and. Uh, and oh, I was talking to Rob Shalsky, who's written books, and his Moon is Hollow book, and he was um, suggesting that the aliens don't really care about us. We're like, uh, you know, ants to them, and uh, they don't well, really care. And, and if anything, there, he also had the suggestion that maybe a lot of aliens would not necessarily be friendly. They'd be more hostile. Well, if you look at what they would see of us, which is... <clears throat> Radio transmissions from a long time ago, television programs from a long time ago, um, satellites, and even if they can see what's happening in the relative nowadays, uh, uh, modern times, um, the thing is, if, if from an outsider's perspective, we are a brutal, nasty race. We are, or we're. We're rather evil creatures. We're not only evil to ourselves, but we're evil to the environment. We're evil to other animals, uh, other species on the planet. Uh, we're reckless. We, uh, we create wars with each other for no really good reason. Um, and so if I were an alien looking at Earth, looking at what the species does and all of that, I wouldn't think that these are friendly people. <laughs> it's one of those things where we we try not to look at ourselves in that respect. We think, oh, that we're, we're wonderful and we're so brilliant and all of this, but we don't really realize that we have a lot of bad sides, too, as a human race. Oh, yeah. If you're looking outside in, you would see a lot of negative and destruction and all sorts of yeah. And Thanks. any creatures in the universe that have atomic bombs, really, I would be scared of them, too. <laughs> well, yeah, and, and if they're really far enough advanced, they'd probably look at it, and it would be like, we'd, they'd be looking at real primitives. Yeah, definitely. Kind of, you know, wow, you know, they. Um, I wouldn't think it would be a real thrill for them to come down and, and be friendly. Yeah. <laughs> No. <laughs> you know. Well, I like Doctor Who, so I I look at that and I look at the way that they treat alien races there and I think, you know, the writers behind this are really creative with the ways that they look at things because they do have that idea, that mindset of they look at us as primitive creatures who are just barbaric and they're oftentimes far more advanced than we are. Well, they should be if they're coming here from a far-off place, because it's something we couldn't do. Yeah, we can we can make it to the moon, and that's about as far, unless unless you want to go to Mars and become on a reality, uh, be on a reality TV show. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's it. I'm in it. <laughs> yeah. No. And so, and so when we get into um, Bigfoot, mm-hmm. what's your thought on Bigfoot? Um... <clears throat> it's it's a good question. I I'm going to have to go with X Files on this and say I want to believe. I I do. I there are a lot of credible people out there who have seen a lot of strange things. Um, I've never personally witnessed a Bigfoot. I have seen when I was about seven years old, at maybe only five. I did see a man come running out of the woods screaming that he saw a Bigfoot not too far away from where I live. Um, <clears throat> but I, you know, I figure anything's possible. I don't believe in ruling something out. Uh, the whole uh, uh, ab- uh, absence of evidence isn't evidence of absence um, mentality 
is something that I do hold dear, I I think it's possible. Uh, and the same thing with um, Wolfmen, like uh, Linda Godfrey uh, writes extensively about. I I know someone who actually believes that he may have seen something like that. He's not sure what it is that he saw, but um, I know someone who is personally who was a very credible person who has actually witnessed something like that. I also know of someone who has now passed away who saw Mothman not too far away from where I live, and he is n he was never into the paranormal at all. Uh, but he was terrified, and he did die of, um, I don't know if it was necessarily a cancer-related illness, but it was something strange that happened around the time that he encountered the Mothman creature on the side of the road. Uh, so there's a lot of strange things out there. I've heard from a lot of people that I trust uh, who have seen things that are way beyond there. And I do live in an area that is pretty high with Bigfoot reports. And most of the Bigfoot reports in my area all come from various police departments. So well, there's <laughs> something to it. <laughs> that, that's not the most reliable nowadays. but <laughs> Well, yeah. Hey, Small but, town police departments. <laughs> you know, there you go. So why, but why, okay, so the big question is why we have never found a body or never come across any... Um, corpses or anything from from the big that's corpse. that's a big question for me too but i you know it's not all animals just lay down and die in wide open spaces um, and in the natural course of um, rotting uh Things you you're, you usually don't find skeletons of animals all over the place all the time. Um, it's it's very there are a lot of places where they could hide, and there's a lot of places that haven't been explored. So may I like to hope that there is some kind of evidence out there because I I, I want to see some evidence myself. And footprint castings are interesting, but I want to see some actual evidence. Yeah. Well, maybe, <sighs> maybe they're bury their own. It that's entirely possible, but not in graveyards. Right. Uh, in grassy areas with stones lining them, uh, like certain television shows that are so blatantly fake now. <laughs> <laughs> make it seem and I'm no way talking about mountain monsters there <laughs> <No>. <laughs> well there we go <laughs> personal endorsements here oh yes <laughs> so, and and I have to get through to the uh, what's, what's your current thought on Ouija boards um, well um, I've always liked Ouija boards. I, my sister and I played with one when we were in our teens. We tried to contact John Lennon. It didn't really work, uh, <laughs> but there was a strange freak hailstorm that lasted a couple of minutes that freaked us out at the time. Um, but I, I really hate when people say that they're evil or that they're demonic or that they're doorways into horrible places and all of that because they are not. They, they were at one time known as spirit boards. They have a history going back to the 1800s and they never had this connotation until the 50s and 60s when movies started coming out talking about how evil that they were and having them summon ghosts and stuff, um, demons and all of that stuff like that. They were actually used more of a telepathic device at one time, they were uh, ways to tap into what would become known as your subconscious. And they were games. Uh, what happened around World War I when sons and daughters started going off to war, more sons and daughters at that time, of course, uh, and soldiers were dying uh, in the field is when the shift started more into trying to use them as a way of communicating with the dead. 
Uh, that was when the major shift really happened in America, and they became known as something used to contact dead spirits. Um, and but it was always trying to contact dead relatives, and it was still not negative up until the movie started coming out. Um, yeah. Oh God, what's his name? I'm trying to remember. It's a guy who has a, a museum and website about William Fold, and I cannot remember his name for the life of me. He's probably going to strangle me if he finds oh, out. Robert Murch. Yes, oh, yes. Okay. Yeah. He he is what I consider one of the uh, best experts on um, the board. Uh, and he's, he has a huge collection of uh, Ouija boards and spirit boards spanning a long period of time. But even he will tell you point blank that these, these devices were never, uh, their history has absolutely nothing to do with demons and portals and all of this other stuff that's become attached to them now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've had him on the show. I've had him on two different shows, and he's uh, mm -hmm. he's a pretty good guy. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. He knows his stuff, yeah. And a very funny guy, too. Yeah, well... <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. No, it was it was it was quite pleasurable. He's a nice guy. Mm -hmm. So, where do you see yourself going? Uh, good question. I I guess I could say I felt like I've been in a writer's slump for a few years now. Uh, there's the first book I ever wrote was self-published and it was not a very good book. <laughs> I made a lot of mistakes in it. I, I I've learned a lot since then about facts that I've gotten wrong, um, and I've been in the process of re-releasing it with a co-author. Uh, we've put it off for about three or four years now. Hopefully, I can finish that at some point in time. Um, but it has to do with the Cuyahoga Valley National Park, which is not too far away from where I live. Uh, it's ghost stories that I've collected over the years uh, dealing with that, and there are hundreds of stories in that national park, hundreds of interesting historical aspects of it that I constantly research. Um, I'd like to get that done. I'm, I'm still writing for what will become Weak and Weird. Um, that's probably the biggest thing that I've been doing lately. I'd, I'd like to get more into writing, but at the same time, just sitting around writing about places is getting a bit tedious. I miss getting out there and actually exploring, so hopefully I will have more opportunities to go out and travel. When I wrote this book, I, I was hoping I would get a big enough publisher who would give me an advance and get to tour, at least tour the United States and visit all of these places. Uh, unfortunately, there was no advance, so I had to do most of the research in the span of three months um, from Ohio. Uh, but I have visited some of these places since then. I've been to Villa Montezuma. I've been to, oh gosh, I've been to a couple of bed and breakfasts and such. I've I can't remember all the places, but I have stopped at some of these places. Um, in the meantime, I'd like to visit a lot of them uh, so I can actually say that I've been there because it's frustrating saying that, no, I haven't actually visited this place. I just interviewed the, the owner over the phone. Um, but I'd like to get more into that. I'd, I'd like to do something more hands-on. I, I have a bit of an artistic side, and I've always liked doing something creative. I'd like to do some experimenting with electricity and technology and <sighs> theories I've had for a long time about paranormal and uh, devices to use that may be better than the type of technology that we're currently using. Um, uh, I have a million ideas in my head, but not enough money and time to accomplish them all. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, story of life. That's how it yes. is. You know. <laughs> yeah. Well, this has been great. I really appreciate you taking the time and doing the interview. Oh, thank you very much for having me. Show is over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Well, 
ากันง่าย This has been a production of the Z Talk Radio Network. I'll be back.